As we continue in our worship, would you join me in your Bibles to John chapter 1 and verse 19. John 1 and verse 19. Our children can join us in their Follow Jesus Bible on page 1140. Now, we're in a series through the Gospel of John. John is inviting you as a reader to come and see Jesus, to come and see that Jesus is the Messiah and that he is the Son of God and that he can grant you eternal life. He can make you right with God. And so that's the invitation and hence the title, Come and See. It's also a narrative. And so we're taking large portions of the text in order to make sure that we understand the author's intent. And so we're going to read a large portion together, if you'll follow me, in John 1, 19 through 34. And this is the testimony of John. Now, John the event. this is going to be confusing, John the evangelist or the apostle is telling us about John the Baptist, and so that's who he's talking about. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny I am, uh, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are not, or if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize you with water, but among you stands one you do not know, and he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. Now as we get into the text, this is an interchange between John, the one who came baptizing. He is not the first Baptist. He is the one who came washing or baptizing. John is interchanging or dialoguing with the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem. And it's This interchange that John, the gospel writer, is using to get you to see something about Jesus. He's using John, the baptizer's testimony as a historical figure in a culture where religious leaders are talking to him and not refuting him, but trying to figure out who he is and what he's doing. And he wants you to receive the witness of John. Now, you notice this is a text that speaks about the rite of baptism. And I think this is an important moment just to say, I want you to notice something. The religious leaders, when they came to John, did not ask him, what are you doing? They knew exactly what he was doing. Because baptism is an Old Testament practice. In fact, there are over 11 types of of baptism in the Old Testament. They are called ceremonial washings. Now, a great text to see this description in the New Testament is in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews, written to the Jewish people to believe in Christ, and this is, uh, this is the, the apostle's testimony in chapter 9 and verse 10. But deal on, uh, speaking of these issues of conscience, that deal only with food and drink and various washings 
regulations for the body imposed until the time of the reformers. That idea of washings is the uh, apostles' reference to the Old Testament practice of baptism. Now, if you read your Old Testament, you're not going to see the word baptism because it's a Greek word. But when the Hebrew and Aramaic was translated into Greek, what we call the Septuagint, the word baptism shows up often interchangeably with these ideas of washings or these ceremonial cleansings. Sometimes it was the part of the person as it was with the priests in Exodus 30. Sometimes it was the whole person like in Leviticus and chapter 14. But the first century Jew had a very clear understanding of what baptism meant. And I love what Guy Richards says. He says, for the first century Jew, baptism would have meant cleansing for, or purification. What was necessary to make a person clean before God. And for that, I would love to recommend this little book from an RTS professor here in Atlanta named Guy Richard. It's a great book on baptism. I would encourage you to read it if you have questions about the differences between other Christian denominations, our brothers and sisters, and our church and what we practice in, ba what we practice in baptism. But it's pretty clear from the text. Baptism by water symbolizes something. It symbolizes the work of Jesus to cleanse us from our sins, and it symbolizes the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The baptism that Jesus will do is Holy Spirit baptism, which is a cleansing from the Lord. Now, there are several aspects to what baptism means in the Scripture. It is certainly cleansing from sin. It is the presence and power, powerful working of the Holy Spirit. It represents our union with Christ. Paul says that we are baptized into Christ in Romans 6 and Ephesians chapter 4. It also represents, represents our baptism, uh, our, our community, because we are baptized together into Christ and into one body. Now, who is John baptizing? Well, he is baptizing the Jewish people who he is preparing to receive their Messiah. And so the Apostle John is recording John the baptizer's ministry in order to get on record this final prophet, this final Old Testament prophet, who is offering symbolic cleansing in anticipation of the cleansing work of Christ. And it's in that interchange and that Jewish, very Jewish understanding of baptism uh, that we encounter this story and the witness of John. And so I think the lesson is Come and see God's Lamb he, uh, sent to wash away your sins, our sins. Come and see the Lamb of God. And in fact, John has this beautiful statement. He says, behold, he wants you to see the Lamb of God who is sent to wash away your sins. So let's look at the text. And we're going to focus not as much on the details, but on the big message of the text. The first thing in the text is, is that John presents you a formal witness for Jesus. John the evangelist is using John the Baptist to present you a formal witness of who Jesus is. And for that, there are two testimonies that are required. Two testimonies are needed to establish a formal testimony concerning someone in Jewish custom. Now you see Jesus actually talk about this in his interchange with the religious leaders in John chapter 8 and verse 17. This is Jesus. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. So Jesus is taking an Old Testament truth out of Deuteronomy of two witnesses being required to establish the guilt of a person or the identity or law, and he's using that in their uh, arguments with him. What John the Baptist is doing is presenting to you two witnesses to be faithful to Jewish law regarding bearing testimony. What are they? Well, the first one is the Holy Spirit. John sees the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus in the form of a dove, and that's a sign to John. That's a testimony John believes and was told that the Holy Spirit would do that. You can see this in Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. Upon his baptism, the Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And so that's the first 
witness or testimony that John is giving. The Holy Spirit bore witness to who Jesus is. The second one is God's testimony concerning Jesus. Upon his baptism, the Father declares something in Luke, uh, in Luke 22, uh, 21 through 22. The Father declares, you are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Now, there's more to this testimony of the Father, because you remember in John 1, 6, John the Evangelist says, there was a man sent from God. Well, John tells us what happened. In Luke chapter 3 and verse 2, John the Baptist was in the desert, and the word of the Lord came to him and said, The Holy Spirit's going to light upon someone. That's going to be the Messiah. This is the interchange that God has with John the Baptist. And notice the language of Luke 3 and verse 2. The word of the Lord. Who is that referencing? Well, remember, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. And so there is a, a real connection here between what John the Baptist received in testimony and what he experienced. And so John's testimony to the Jewish leaders has two witnesses as required by law to establish the veracity of a person or of a statement. So John the evangelist is using John the Baptist to tell you, listen, this has been verified, not just by this individual, but other people saw the dove, other people heard the voice. The testimony of this individual is being verified by other witnesses. And so John is inviting you to see Jesus, and to believe on this historical uh, illustration of uh, an example of the verification of who Jesus is. But there's a second thing. John is inviting you to be prepared for the arrival of Jesus. John is inviting you to be prepared to receive Jesus. And that, again, is John's intent. He's writing so that you will believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you will have life in his name. Now, John the Baptist is, does, doesn't always have the most uh, compassionate invitation to come and see Jesus. In fact, he is, uh, in Luke chapter 3 and verse 7, people are coming to him to be baptized as he has called them to repentance. And this is what he says, You brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee the wrath of God? Now, we learn in a synoptic gospel, a similar gospel, with a similar storyline and timeline, Matthew 3 and verse 7, that Jesus was talking to the Jewish leaders. Maybe even the same Jewish leaders in the same interchange that John is recording here. So you can imagine the Jewish leaders are showing up to John and they're submitting to his baptism, but before they do, they say, are you the Christ? And he says, no. Well, are you Elijah? No. Are you the prophet? No. Well, then why are you baptizing? Whose authority do you have? And so John is, um, is calling people to something in his baptism. And what is he calling them to? Well, he, he gives us a clue on what his baptism means, on what his ministry is about, and how he is trying to help his audience be prepared for the person of Jesus. He is a voice crying in the wilderness. You see that quote taken from Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. Speaking of the one who would come and prepare the way for God's servant, for the great prophet who would come, who we know as Jesus. Now, in the text, Israel has been exiled to Babylon and then the Persian Empire. And so Isaiah is prophesying of the day when Israel will come back to Jerusalem into the presence of God. Because remember, God had put his presence in the temple at Jerusalem. And so bringing them back, a path had to be cleared metaphorically. The road had to be prepared. And what Isaiah is doing is saying, hey, you guys have got to get a path cleared. You've got to prepare the way to come back into the presence of God. Now, the road was not the issue. Isaiah is not arguing for capital... uh, projects being done in the kingdom. The road is a metaphor for their hearts. He is, Isaiah is calling them to repentance for their sins. And that's exactly what John is doing. And so John is very masterful. John the Baptist, very masterful in quoting Isaiah because what was his ministry? Well, we'll see. 
He is a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. The mountains need to be laid low. The valleys cleared out of debris. Everything needs to be prepared so we can go home to be in the presence of the Lord. And this is, again, a metaphor for sin. Uh, John is also inviting you to be prepared because someone eternal is coming. And you notice some of his language. He says, uh, the way of the Lord and the word of God, uh, the word of our God in Isaiah chapter 40. These are synonymous, or not synonymous, but these are, uh, notice the Lord, the way of the Lord, and then the word of our God. These are the things that John is uh, speaking about this eternal figure who is coming. Notice what he says, uh, how, he, how he describes him, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Uh, this is John, this great prophet. John the Baptist was actually the son of Zechariah. He is of the house. His mother was of the lineage of the Levites, um, Elizabeth. So he comes from a priestly family and would have had some standing in Jerusalem among the religious leaders. And John is now saying, whoever this person is coming, this figure who John doesn't know yet, uh, because it hasn't been revealed to him, uh, he is, uh, I am unworthy to untie his sandal. I'm going to take the position of a servant in untying his sandal. And then he says, uh, he ranks before me because he was before me. Now you see an allusion there, again, to the eternality of the person who is coming. Jesus was John's cousin. Jesus was born after John the Baptist, and yet John, once he recognizes who the Messiah is, understands that he actually existed prior to John, because John is referencing his eternality. And so John is trying to get you ready for this, this eternal person who is coming, and he wants you to be ready for his revival, I mean, for his arrival. And how does he do that? What does he say? Well, he's making straight the way of the Lord. And he says, for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Now remember, baptism is a sign of cleansing. It's a sign of repentance. It's a sign that we are confessing that we're sinners in need of the cleansing work of God. And so John is saying, hey, I want, I'm inviting you to be prepared for the person who is coming. I am a voice calling to repentance, clearing the path back to God summoning you to be ready for this eternal person who is greater than me and be ready for his arrival. And that's why he preaches the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Because when Messiah arrives, John the Baptist wants God's people to be ready for his arrival, to be repenting of their sins, turning from their sins, so that they can be ready to receive Messiah. Now, He doesn't stop there. It's a beautiful text in Luke chapter 3 in verse 8 and then verses 10 through 14. Because that's when he says to the religious leaders, who warned you, you brood of vipers, to flee from the wrath of God. And then he says this, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And then he lists the fruits. And they're fruits of no longer extorting people financially. It's fruits of good deeds to those who are oppressed. It's the very sins that Israel had committed that got them sent into exile. And John is calling them to repentance. He is calling them to prepare their hearts for the kingdom of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is, in fact, his message. This is his one-liner sermon, which I'm sure... Every parishioner would love the pastor to have a one-liner sermon. Sorry, we don't do that. Um, the, the message is very simple. We see it in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is John's message. This is what the baptism was. It was calling God's people who thought they were, they were fine. And John even says, don't lean on Abraham. Don't assume that you're right with God because of your parents or because of your faithfulness to the law. No, no, no. You need to turn from your sins and be ready to greet the Messiah who is coming. The third thing John does is he 
presents you the cleansing work of Christ. Now this is interesting. He calls you to repentance. He calls you to turn from your sins. But then he presents to you the cleansing work of Christ. Why? Because the call to repentance is not a call to cleanse yourself. But it is a call to turn to God for cleansing. Guys, get that. When we say we need to repent of our sins, what we're saying is we need to turn from our sins. But the ability to do that is something we have to look to God for, and the ability to remove the stain of our sins in our lives is something only God can do. And so John the Baptist can say, turn from your sins, get ready for Messiah, but then he can say, and by the way, this is the very person who is going to cleanse you from those sins. And that's why he calls them the Lamb of God. He says, behold, the Lamb of God. Why does he do that? Well, this is a reference certainly to all the Lamb of God uh, 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 types in the Scripture. Every time the idea of a lamb being slain or a lamb being the sins of a person being placed on the scapegoat and it walking out of the city, all of these are pictures for us. They are shadows of the reality of who Christ is. But since John the Baptist is quoting Isaiah, it seems to be that he is quoting from Isaiah 52 and verse 13 through 53, 12. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've each turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know this text, I'm sure, very well. But think of the language beginning in chapter 52. So, speaking of Christ, so shall he sprinkle many nations. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, Uh, Isaiah says, and he shall bear or carry their iniquities. And I love how Isaiah 53 ends uh, in verse 12. He says this, therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Why? Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for their transgressions. Folks, John the Baptist And John, the author, want you to pause and see this the arrival of this individual for who he is. He is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. And that's what he says next. Who takes away the sin of the world. Now, in this text, because he's quoting from Isaiah 52 and 53, Isaiah says to us that uh, he will sprinkle many nations. And so in that context of the quote from Isaiah, it seems that the word world here is referring to not Jews or Gentiles or sinners, but all mankind in their ethical state against the Lord, not re- uh, irregardless of race or creed. And so what John is saying, John the Baptist quoting Isaiah, is God has come to save not just the Jews, but Gentiles, all humanity, all who will believe. And how does he do it? Well, he takes away their sin. Literally, he carries it away. And this certainly is a picture of the scapegoat in the Old Testament where the hands, the bloody hands of the person would be laid on the goat, symbolizing their sin, their guilt, transferring to the goat, and the goat would be sent away. And the goat carries their sin away. And this is what Isaiah says, the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And so John is presenting to us the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then he says, he's also the one who baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. And there's that connection again with baptism, this cleansing rite, which is not, we do it with water, but it symbolizes what we are asking God to do through the Holy Spirit, to cleanse us from our sin. And so water cleansing symbolizes the spiritual cleansing of the Holy Spirit. And this is how Isaiah speaks of it. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Notice that her iniquity has been pardoned. It has been forgiven. And this is what the Spirit of God does. He applies the cleansing work of Christ, that sacrifice of Christ as the Lamb of God. He applies that to those who repent and believe. And so John is presenting to you, wants you to stop and see that this historical figure who he now knows as Jesus because he's heard the testimony of God upon his cousin Jesus, he now knows who it is, but he wants you to be uh, prepared to receive him, 
to receive the cleansing work that this figure Jesus provides to all who repent and believe, and he wants to prepare you and testify uh, to who this person is. Finally, John declares the deity of Jesus, and this is how he ends uh, this section. He says, uh, I have borne us, uh, I have both seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. I have both seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. And this again is something he heard in the testimony of God the Father at the baptism of Jesus when he said, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And so John is presenting to us the deity of Christ and God's provision through him to cleanse us from our sin as the Lamb of God. Now, some applications. The first one is, where are you looking for cleansing? Where are you looking for cleansing? We all carry the baggage of sin in our lives. We all carry a sense of guilt and a sense of shame. And if you, if you say, well, I don't, I don't feel that way, I think a little digging, and you probably would have to acknowledge that there are things you did in your youth or that you are continuing to do that you know are offensive to God, offensive to life and community, offensive in your family. What are you doing with those things? How are you, uh, how are you dealing with that baggage of sin? Most of us try and do something to outweigh it. I have this much guilt and feeling of shame over my sin, so I'm going to do some good deeds. I'm going to try and balance the scales so that my goodness outweighs my badness, and somehow my goodness will cancel out my badness. Some people say, well, I'm going to go do, do good deeds to people. I'm going to help. I'm going to serve. Or I'm going to get involved in a cause. And causes are great. I'm getting involved in one this Friday. Uh, causes are wonderful to be a part of and to support calls for justice in our community. But folks, don't get involved in a cause if it's to assuage guilt or to somehow claim moral high ground. Well, look at what I'm involved in. Look how I've, this somehow, what we're doing is trying to cancel out our guilt. And we're looking for cleansing. Where are you looking for cleansing? How are you dealing with the baggage of sin that you carry. You know, Christians are often not living in the freedom of the grace of God, and they serve in the church, or they do their giving in the church, or they, they uh, do ministry in the community in order to try and, and have their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds. Folks, this is not the gospel. And this, this is why the second application is, have you considered that God has provided for you? John is testifying to you. John the Baptist is testifying to you. And John, the author of the text, is using him to show you God has provided for your cleansing. You don't need to go through all these processes and schemes and, and attempts to provide for that cleansing. God has done it for you in Jesus Christ. Now, that sounds like a get out of wrath of God free card. Let me tell you, the gospel's that good. God is that generous, and the atoning work, the cleansing work of Jesus is that powerful to cleanse you from the, the things that you won't tell anybody. God has provided for you. It is that, that good. And so I would ask you, have you considered God's provision for you? Christian, are you living in the no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus? How do you handle your own guilt? Whether guilt that you put on yourself or that others put on you. How do you handle that? God has provided for that. The, second, uh, the third thing is how will you respond to John's testimony? John the evangelist, the apostle, the author of this book, is using John the Baptist to present to you verifiable, not to you specifically, but to his original audience, people who knew John the Baptist, people who knew the religious leaders of the day, people who were there. He is using their testimony to say, hey, you can't, you, you, you can't go back in time and argue with verifiable facts. These are verifiable facts that John is writing and wants you to believe. How will you respond to this testimony? 
the public witness of a Levite to other religious leaders. These are serious claims that are not refuted that you need to consider as you think about who Jesus is. And how do you see Jesus? When you look at him, what do you see? Do you see the Lamb of God? Do you see the Father sending the Son to rescue you from your sin? I would love to help you explore what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We have these books called Life Issue Books. If you will email me, my email address is on the webpage. I would love to send you one and work with you online and let you explore the person and the work of Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, thanks for the time in your word. Strengthen us as we live out this great truth that the Lamb of God has come. And for all who repent and believe, he has pardoned their sin. In Jesus' name, amen.